Welcome to Consented, a podcast series by UserCentrics, where we talk to our most trusted partners about all things data privacy, digital marketing, SaaS, and of course, the thing that ties it all together, partnerships. Are you ready? Let's dive in. Welcome to our first episode of Consented, a privacy and trust in SaaS partnership. It's a webinar podcasted series hosted by UserCentrics, industry leader in consent and preference management solutions. My name is Hannah Sorg, strategic partner manager at UserCentrics, and I will be your host today. And I'm more than excited to guide you through this captivating uh, exploration of data privacy, consent, user rights, online marketing trends, and so on. So our journey is always filled by expert interviews, uh, thought-provoking discussions, and of course, actionable tips that Im will improve your ability to navigate the complex area of consent and data protection. So what we want to achieve is that consent is not just a passive experience, it's an opportunity to learn, engage, and also stay ahead of the curve. So today, in the first episode, we'll be unpacking insights into data privacy trends, but also market marketing trends for 2024. We're exploring the post third party data area and also what's coming next in the Kugelers world. And we're also delving into the critical role of partnerships in navigating privacy landscape changes. But before we jump right into it, so as I said before, it's just the three of us today. Uh, we have Frank Fu, MarTech expert and CEO of Matelso since 2006. He has shaped his company into a leading call tracking technology player, and he has already gained 25 years experience in tech and is now advancing it into a digital customer experience platform, leveraging a 360 degree view aligned with customer goals. So thank you for taking your time, Frank. Then on the other side, from the user-centric side, we have Tilman Hameling, senior expert privacy at user-centric. Um, Tillman, with a career centered on the complexity of privacy, brings diverse experience in understanding the markets. So he's working at UserCentric since 2018 and navigates the dynamic privacy landscape and seeking innovation opportunities. Besides that, he's also supporting companies and universities with his ex expertise and speaking uh, at events like uh, PriveSec Global, OMR, the Mexico BCG, MarTech Series and Leadership Beyond Borders. So thank you for being part of this today. Um, and we have Abra here. Hi, Abra. Okay, then I will also quickly introduce you before we start into it. Uh, we uh, are very happy that you are also part uh, of that. So we have Abra Sami, uh, Product Marketing Manager at Doric. Um, Doric is a website building platform and Abra leverages data-driven insight uh, to create imp impactful campaigns that drive brand engagement and revenue growth. He has a solid foundation in tech and marketing and also a degree in debt management. And he has a keen understanding of business, but also customer needs and also how to align uh, with them to get innovative solutions. So thank you uh, for being part of it. Um, I would say uh, let's dive right into it. So in the rapidly changing landscape of data protection, I think understanding the changing attitudes of consumers is key. So we all know that uh, technology advances and also the awareness of privacy issues increases because yeah, as we all know, we're clicking on a website. The first thing that pops up is a cookie banner. I download an app. The first thing that pops up is do I want to allow app tracking? So people are starting to claim their rights and they also start to developing a new relationship with their personal data. So I would say with this in mind, it's crucial to look at the rapid changes in how individuals perceive and also prioritize uh, data privacy. So talking about data privacy, looking at you, Tillman, uh, can you give us an insight of how consumers have the attitudes towards data privacy in the last years, how no, behavior? No. Uh, good point. Good point. Maybe uh, one thing, because you mentioned it um, very, very much, is we are all aware of when we are downloading an application or when we are seeing something on a website, for example, then um, we see a cookie banner. We see a CMP. We have to say something. We have to answer something. And um, this is not just something that we see in Europe. So we see an increased uh, awareness, basically worldwide. In Europe, it started in 2018, but in the US then 2020, at least in California, and then more and more states, um, basically time after time came next to uh, California. Then China and Brazil, for example, India, Japan, South Korea, etc. And 
um, basically a fundamental point here is when you are surrounded all the time by something that informs you about um, a risk or a right that you potentially get through a data protection regulation, then obviously this has to or this will change um, your perception uh, towards the importance of data protection. So obviously, yes, um, there's a growing concern uh, among consumers about how companies collect, use, and fundamentally also store their data. And also next to it, I mean, potentially some of the of the listeners and also some of uh, some of the panelists here uh, have watched a couple of Netflix documentaries, which are out there on Cambridge Analytica, for example. And um, we see this uh, this reaction basically on um, on two sides. One is uh, we see the this um, shift of perception and the shift in behavior uh, behavior through the data protection authorities because they are increasingly um, execute the rights of end users. End users on the other side obviously uh, increasingly ask for their rights. They're requesting it. They're handing it complaints. And on the other side, and um, we see it also in the numbers of our own um, content management platform. So we see there that more and more users are actually interacting deeper in the CMP, interacting additionally um, through pressing the more information button. Uh, so to be honest, that was a long answer, but a long story short, um, it's a yes, we are seeing a shift in the behavior here. May I yeah, raise thanks. a question? Yeah. Don't yes, you of need, course. Uh, a consent first to analyze the clicks on your CM content management platform. You know what I mean? Is it not a uh, uh, how do you say in English a uh, chicken a chicken and egg problem? You say because you just said said you <laughs> analyze the clicks, but yeah, yeah. how can you analyze the click if you didn't allow? A good question. Um, to be honest, this could be also a question going deeper. And for example, the privacy sandbox and the aggregation of data. So one yeah. a principle here is also um, if we take a look at one individual data set or at the huge aggregation of end users in total. Yeah? When we say, for example, we are taking a look at 100,000 users all at one place, then we are allowed to take a look and uh, basically uh, analyze the data there. Uh, but you're right. If I would just say I really want to identify the consent behavior of Frank himself, then I would need your consent for it. Uh, so good question. As you are the yeah. expert, if I may raise another question. The last time I had a closer look to the definition of data protection in this silo we are currently in, but we are just yes. talking about, what is the hardcore criteria to say now we reach the relationship between the data and the individual being. What a lawyer told me three years ago was when we are talking about first-party cookies, it's because in the old old technology world, first-party cookie is the IP address, which makes the door open. Is it still the criteria? Did I get the right information? Yeah. You know what I mean? Because the definition I understand is we need to take care about data protection and the opt-in at the point of time where we can have a relationship of data between data and a human being. But what is the true trigger? I like to understand these details because you mentioned it before and also in our introduction, a lot of emotions maybe, whether positive or negative, because the entire industry is in there. And yeah, yeah. not enough people try to understand truly what is the trigger where I open the door where we need to talk about and which, uh, which are, yes, as I said, which are the criteria? Yeah, so also a good question. And the definition for it we see is um, in the GDPR. And there is a definition of what, for example, is personal identifiable information and what is also personal data. And to be honest, um, it is not... I would say 100% clear, and this is well a question uh, every time pops up, but one um, explanation, to be honest, on what PII is, if we are going to the cinema, we see 100 people, and one of them has a green shirt and 99 other have, has a, have a red shirt, then also this could be personal identifiable information because you can identify a person through it. And this is at least how, it, uh, how it's stated in the GDPR. 
Yeah, thank you uh, for the discussion. I really like it. <laughs> and also uh, thank you, Tim. And I think that was a very nice introduction uh, for this uh, panel discussion. Uh, I think we will come later also uh, to that point that you mentioned that there are more regulations out there and that it's sometimes a little bit hard to understand uh, what these are about. So, uh, Frank, I would like to talk a little bit about online marketing. Um, because I think also not only the data privacy landscape is rapidly changing, it's also about the marketing uh, or online marketing environment, uh, which is, of course, related to data protection. So I think in the last years, we also talked about artificial intelligence a lot, um, also ChatGPT and so on. So I just wanted to talk a little bit about um, what are anticipated future trends in online marketing for this year and also if they are aligned with data privacy concerns. Can you give us an insight about that? I try to approach the very broad question. Uh, if you allow me to make the time window of my analysis 10 years big, uh, I would share the following observation. 10 years ago, when I was, was at the DMX, I was surprised how, sorry, how fucking big the market for publishers and advertisers is who, who are using the third party cookies. It's a huge market where huge brands invest a lot of money to make sure that their brand gets recognized out there in the internet somewhere on any kind of websites. It was a big surprise. Now, more or less 10 years later, what I observe is still there's a battle for being observable out there as being a brand, but people getting more performance driven, which means they do not just want to count impressions where the advertising pops up on any kind of website. They truly, truly uh, want to understand how many conversions did they generate on a specific website or landing page, name it as you want. And um, I love the scenario to, to talk about the automotive industry, because here we have exactly the two main strengths, which are reinvented somewhere. This, the, the automotive industry has the, the fingerprint to have a strong centralized brand where huge budgets exist to make this, these, uh, to run these display campaigns. On the other side, you have the car dealers looking for simple deals, for test drives for automotive cars. And uh, my perspective is how I see the world also with the changes of the third party cookies, which uh, are getting more or less turned off. The beautiful world five years or 10 years even down ago, we just take 500,000 euro, put them on the table of a marketing agency. Here is my, um, yeah, my display banners with my brand and make sure that they get sh shown somewhere on the internet. This simple, beautiful world is challenged because of the technology change with third party cooking, which is uh, threatening this approach. And secondly, the car dealers are raising their hands. They say, listen, guys, are you burning the money with just brand advertising? Or do you invest the money in the sense of that we are getting true leads where we can make business with? And then we are going uh, later questions. We're going to see that the first parquety cookie, which is still possible to use, because you were mentioned in your introduction, a cookie-less world, also we must make, make sure that we don't have a misunderstanding. Cookies are still ex uh, existing and also allowed. Just a question, what kind of cookie and do we have the consent etc pp and this is a shift i see i see and um yeah and also having this first party cookie approach being much more performance driven is the evolution i have observed during the last i would say five to ten years yeah and is thank it, you. To, to, to answer your question properly you also ask is it in line uh with a data privacy concern, I would say yes, because the core technology, if I have the traffic on my website, on the dealer's website, it's my website. I'm not mm -hmm. dependent anymore from any kind of publishers or advertisers. A publisher, yeah. sorry. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Um, yeah, you already mentioned like first party data. I think that's also a really nice approach to get very high quality data and also directly from your target audience, which is also pretty nice. Um, I think besides that, because I also mentioned that AI is a big, big topic, um, maybe to bring Abre uh, into the conversation, um, 
I think Doric also has a new feature, which is called a Doric AI, which can draft a complete website in seconds and the user doesn't really need to care about it, which sounds, of course, amazing. So um, maybe you can also tell us a little bit about trends in AI and also what are the implications of using AI in online marketing, um, also with concerning data privacy and security. Do you have an answer for us sure. about that? Well, Hannah, thank you for uh, letting me speak. And also uh, just wanted to apologize for being a little late to uh, this uh, wonderful webinar you guys have here. So your question was regarding, um, you know, the trends in AI. And um, of course, there are a lot of concerns. There's a new wave happening since uh, 2023. Lots of, uh, you know, the reason why we... Uh, got into AI was not because of the fear of missing out, but also um, we noticed that we can actually help users save a lot of time building websites. Now with websites, there's an end user and that person is building the website for another end user. And when the visitors come in and, um, you know, they get you know, they see all these things and there's a, you know, um, concern about security. <clears throat> we um, ask, you know, people can just add any tools like user centrics, a cookie bot, and, you know, ask for, uh, you know, their, you know, a consent. Um, but, uh, you know, when uh, AI doesn't really affect that uh, landscape, it's, uh, it's the laws um the gdpr compliance is there and uh, the trend of ai probably has not touched uh, that landscape yet but what ai can do is you know if i'm uh, building a tool like for my for my end user um hey could you like read my audience and tell me if i should change my uh, landing pages messaging uh, so that it looks more personalized. And, you know, if, if somebody comes, uh, come, somebody sees it, it might be really scary for them, you know, like, hey, um, this looks too personalized. So uh, there's that. And also, I'm not going to, um, also, it's worth mentioning how, um, you know, uh, misinformation might flood up when you're letting AI write the copy for your website and all that. So, um if AI might be building websites, AI might be, you know, going into the landscape of, you know, trying to understand our audience, but we also need to, you know, um, you know, control our AI or, or these uh, models that we're building, because at the end of the day, you know, we should be humans after all. So I think that's, a, that's my um, take on this question you have. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. I think if we're talking about AI, because looking at the current uh, Europe regulations, I think we have the European digital strategy and uh, the strategy has like five acts and we also have their day AI act. Um, mm -hmm. Is it like okay um, using the AI tools or is it um, maybe before we get into it, um, maybe just wanted to ask if it's um, for you, if you have that also in mind, like these regulations, um, like the AI Act, before you started to develop the AI website builder? Of course. And of course, yeah. Um, we kept, uh, we have a lot of uh, users coming from France specifically. So we need to keep the, uh, you know, the laws of the country of the EU in mind when we uh, build any anything or make any changes to our platform. And uh, we also have this inbuilt analytics um, in our platform. So unlike uh, tools like Google Analytics and stuff like that, it's more privacy friendly and it's compliant with GDPR. So in that way, you know, if you're if you want to look at the analytics of your site, you can always, um, you know, use our inbuilt analytics instead of like a GA4 or a tool that, you know, uh, violates maybe some uh, of the uh, GDPR compliance. Okay, cool. Um, I have a question. Yeah, yeah, of course, Frank. Aber you mentioned a very important buzzword, which I would like to challenge or maybe please give me your feedback about my thoughts. You were talking about threats. Uh, oh no, it's scaring. It's scaring for website visitors if the content gets too much individual. 
I yeah. live a, sometimes I'm a, in a dream world. Uh, once or twice a, uh, in my life or per year, whatever, I have the luck and chance to fly with Lufthansa and uh, to be in something I would call a VIP lounge. And the more personal the people working for Lufthansa talk to me, the better I feel being a customer. <laughs> if you go to your Italian restaurant and uh -huh. uh, the owner of the restaurants doesn't say, good evening, sir, if he says, good evening, Abra, what <laughs> feels better? So what, yeah, I'm wondering, course, course. what I'm wondering in a 100% non-digital world, <laughs> yeah, we have yeah. our daily life, we appreciate and someone says to me, my name, knows my preferences, knows mm -hmm. my Uh, di how do you say in English? Dietary res res restrictions. <laughs> I love potato. Yeah. I hate red wine and so on. So everybody yeah. loves it. Yeah. Where you does know, it come from that in the, in the digital world, suddenly mm. everybody wants to say 100% anonymous and not having individual content or individual conversations? Yeah. Do you have yeah. an explanation for this phenomenon? Yeah, I do. Um, it's actually something that I put a, put a lot of thought into, actually. Um, you know, there are a lot of restaurants that, you know, before you book a reservation, they ask you, hey, uh, what's your, uh, are you, do you like gluten-free? Are you vegan? And stuff exactly. like that. Yeah, there, there, there are certainly a lot of restaurants like that. But the best explanation that I, it may sound very obvious, but, you know, the digital world is something that's, um, especially social media and websites, you know, the internet just flourished in the last, um, what do you call it, 10 years, maybe a decade. So I think it's still maturing in that sense because it's ironic, obviously, but, you know, people are still, you know, getting, you know, used to that idea of personalization. You know how, they're, like um, uh, Tim, Till mentioned about Cambridge Analytica and, you know, how these awarenesses are getting created, how, um, you know, these people, they're rigging campaigns with our data, with our, with our you know, stuff like that. So um, there is a notorious feeling inside people. And I think it's going to change, but maybe, maybe in 10, 20 years, maybe. Mm. Yeah. I, also, also, I, <laughs> uh, I would, I would quickly also, I'd like to add something here because we uh, fundamentally have to differentiate uh, what are we personalizing in the background. So is it either the ad about you as Frank or is it the content that you would like to read on, an, on a newspaper or on something else? Is it the, the shoe that you potentially would like to buy or is it the ad of something that you potentially don't need and this is a huge a differentiation of personalization um where we also see um in the background uh, a couple of lawsuits going into direction so we have to be very careful also whenever we are reading uh, statistics on how beneficial um personalization is for end users or not so in that regards um i would really differentiate the two things of course it's very beneficial if the waiter knows your name and if the waiter knows your dietary etc but on the other side um do you want the waiter to sell you something that you potentially don't want? And this is uh, the differentiation here also. So I would say the digital side is not that different actually to the real world. Maybe also to ask you, Tillman, I think um, if we talk about preferences, I mean, there are also solutions out there like preference management solutions where you can say, I always want to be notified if you have in your favorite online store, always white shirts in size M. For example, like I yeah. think then we get, as, 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 as I said before, like zero first party data with very high quality directly from your target audience. So I think that's also kind of a preference. Totally. Yeah. I mean, preference management is totally something uh, which perfectly fits in here where we can say this is my size. This is the product that I'm interested in. And this could be super beneficial also in terms of personalization. So it should be for the benefit of the end user. Then personalization is a good thing. And if not, then we might have a problem. Yeah, I agree with someone here. I agree. Also. Yeah. <laughs> Perfect. Um, but if we're talking now about, uh, yeah, because we talked about as well as um, on the I Act and so on, I just wanted to ask if there are also some data privacy trends this year that we have to look out for. Um, Timan, are there any regulations or laws that are super interesting this year? 
Um, yeah, for sure. I mean, you also, you already mentioned the uh, European data strategy. Um, part of it is the AI Act. So the regulation of AI is for sure a big thing. But right next to it, we see um, the Digital Services Act, but also the Digital Markets Act, which in the end are two regulations which are handling uh, especially the big players. So the Digital Markets Act, for example, uh, they are handling uh, the so-called gatekeepers. Gatekeepers are companies uh, which have a lot of traffic, like Google, for example, or Microsoft. Um, Apple is behind it. Amazon also. ByteDance, uh, which is the daughter of uh, the very well-known TikTok. And um, what we see also very much here from the um, uh, from the advertising world, also from the a consent world is that the DMA partly also covers parts of the GDPR. What is meant by that is the DMA makes gatekeepers to ask for consent in the future, which means basically uh, if you are having a website, for example, and you are using Google Analytics uh, or Google Ads, for example, then Google has to make sure in the future that uh, you actually have consent. And through that, they're using the Google consent mode. And this is uh, for sure one big thing um, where everyone who is using the tools potentially get uh, a reminder that the deadline will be soon. I think it's uh, somehow end of March and that companies have to implement the Google consent mode if they want to continue using Google Analytics and Google Ads on the website in the future. I would say this is fundamentally a very, very big thing um, while, discussing, while discussing trends uh, in the future um, according to the regulatory side. Yeah, thank you. Um, because you were talking about the Digital Markets Act and Digital Service Act, I think it would be also kind of interesting for our audience to know the difference, because I think that's also sometimes a little bit difficult to understand, just very high level. Yeah, and um, the difference is basically uh, which uh, part it's actually tackling. So again, the Digital Markets Act is going after the super, super big uh, companies like, again, Google, um, Amazon, or for example, uh, so everyone, which is really very, very well known and the DSA, the Digital Services Act, uh, tackles some other things. Um, also platforms like, for example, we are having uh, booking.com is one thing. I think Zalando is still in discussion there. Um, uh, one thing is that the Digital Markets Act focuses on kind of making sure that Europe can still be um, again, innovative in the digital space. And the Digital Services Act is taking a look also talking about interoperability that you can connect um, to the other services without having uh, some kind of trouble. So long story short, both of the acts are basically looking into making sure that we have fair um, digital markets here in Europe and that also smaller companies have a chance to compete against the big ones. Yeah, thank you. I think we talked a lot about data privacy regulation. So I just want to switch a little bit the topic and talk a little bit about data. Uh, also looking at you, Frank, because you've been in the business for so long, because we all know in the fast paced world of uh, online businesses, one of the key challenges lies in transforming anonymous website visitors into loyal customers. So just wanted to ask if you can give us an insight, how can businesses transform uh, this anonymous visitors into the loyal customers, maybe also keeping data privacy in mind. Absolutely. Uh, I mean, there are certainly hundreds of strategies to do so, and it uh, depends a little bit, however, uh, as always, uh, from the business model. But I think already the briefing you gave me is already mature state. We have achieved a lot of things because we have a website visitor on our website, which is already uh, a great milestone, right? What we observe being 15 years in the business is that we can observe uh, one important, well, one, one main thing. What are the touch points we offer on our website to our web website visitors once they would like to stop clicking around and just talk to someone who runs the website? Um, this is one thing, and of course, to maybe the first step before this one is to have a, a content which is not gated. I think this ungated content stuff is uh, the, something which pops up in hundreds of conferences. Uh, it's quite an important thing to have an, a website which is not too having too much the, the touch 
of being a uh, advertising website, being a website with true valuable content, customizable products, and so on. But the next crucial step from our perspective uh, is that we offer the website visitors the touch points, run any kind of conversation with the employee of the website owner. Because what also internally within Natel, so we make the definition of a one to many communication. And on the other side, we have a one to one communication. The very first one is more or less standardized. Because I'm dreaming about features uh, of Abra, where every website visitor gets 100% personalized website. Nevertheless, we're not yet there. So it's more or less still standardized. But as I said, as I said at a certain point of time, the individual content needs to be exchanged between the potential customer, which is the prospect and the employees, and this needs to be run via a conversation. And which touch point we are using today, or which communication channel, whether it's the chat, the video call, or call, or form sheet, name it as you want, is a crucial step to get the foot in the door. Because make sure that you have the step, you have someone on your website, you have great content, but what is the next step? Of course, in a e-commerce scenario, check out is great, but never, nevertheless, uh, also an entire industry uh, is tackling how do we make sure that people do not leave our website once they have an e-bike in the basket already worth 5,000 euro, and suddenly they have questions, something is not working, etc. cetera, pay, pay. Make, make sure, as you said, how do we attract to get loyal customers to get this um, conversational part? Let me just share one amazing uh, experience I did five years ago with one big telecommunication player in the German market. Uh, I can't share the name, but uh, if you talk about big, big uh, carriers in Germany, uh, there are not hundreds, just half a dozen or more, more or less. And I had the chance to meet uh, the former CEO. And he said, we have today 600 agents in our call centers in order to make sure that our prospects and existing customers can talk to us not only by phone, email, blah, 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 service sense, old school. We made a management decision to increase the amount of agents in our service centers to up to 1,000. The market is so competitive in this communication world, standardized products, standardized prices, campaigns from Easter, Black Week to Christmas, and so on. How can we differentiate being a huge company, not only offering our service in Germany, but through entire Europe? And it was a, was a success path. And you, 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 are, you are able to make rewards uh, uh, engineering. If you remember the TV campaigns two, three years ago in Germany, where a man showed up and said, I'm your guy to talk to. <laughs> it was a little hint if someone was interested in which company was it. Yes, and the, this is, uh, from our perspective, the next evolutionary step. As we said, we are already lucky to have the website visitor ungated content, individual content, customizing, blah, blah, blah. And then make sure that you give some one-to-one -one option to run any kind of conversation. Yeah, makes sense, makes sense. I don't know, Abra, you're also coming from the marketing uh, area. Do you also have some insights or from your experience? Yeah, of course. Like uh, what uh, Frank said over here, you know, um, we have our sales team, um, you know, uh, talking to our prospects, learning about them, just wanting to know that what made you click uh, into our website and, you know, if you're if they're interested. So, you know, um, we get to learn about the prospect and we get to teach them about uh, the product even more. And I agree 100 percent with Frank, you know, they're anonymous and you shouldn't be forcing somebody to buy something if they're only willingly trying to contact you. You remember one thing also, 15 years ago, if I remember the first website which I remember, uh, everybody was hiding his phone number. The regulation came up and said, you need something like an imprint. Who runs the website? And the next iteration of the imprint regulation was, make sure that you have a phone number there. And the next evolutionary step, you are not allowed to put a premium rate phone number. 0900 in Germany, where you pay 30 or well, up to 3 euro per minute. Regulation says now, make sure that you have an imprint, make sure that you have a phone number, and make sure that this phone number can be dialed for just a couple of cents per minute. Uh, what I want to say, this was forced, and nobody in the 
the, the guys who set up the website 15 years ago, yeah. we just want clicks, we just want clicks. And then it popped up. Okay, this is also a little bit part of our Matezo story. This is not uh, our, our uh, webinar today. But nevertheless, I see the waves going through the market, how the people play with these kind of touch points. They understand, okay, we need a nice website. Loading time, speed page, responsive, blah, blah, blah. But they play around now today, not just having a phone number, or even a fax number, which is really stupid, but nevertheless, in the imprint, they try to play around, maybe just offer a touch point on a website if the value in the shopping basket is exceeding a certain value. Worth 5,000 euro in my shopping basket, I have a website visitor who gives me so many signals that he wants to buy something. Give him a chance to raise a question now, individually. Yeah, definitely. Um, so in terms of time, I think we unfortunately have to come to an end because uh, yeah, it's already uh, 40 minutes. Um, but I want to give an outlook and we also have some topics there. So um, I just wanted to know what are the main challenges business face in implementing privacy friendly marketing practices and also how can they become overcome? So Before I head over to uh, one of you and you give some insights, I think from my pers perspective, I think about partnerships because partnering with someone means also to get their experience, expertise and also knowledge. Um, so maybe like we have now with Doric, um, I think that also really helps because um, the partner can also uh, focus on the core business. Um, I don't know if someone wants to add something there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I agree uh, with what you said. Um, partnerships, they do uh, really help in marketing. You get to come to uh, more audience, you know, with with uh, like user centric uh, audiences looking at us right now. You know, they know about Frank, they know about me, the companies. So, yeah, it's, it's a pretty neat strategy. Definitely. And I think also when we're talking about a lot of online marketing, data privacy, developments, updates, and so on. I think it's sometimes really hard to understand, uh, also for the business uh, themselves to understand what's going on. But maybe also a question to you, uh, how can businesses ensure that also their clients uh, understand what's going on? Like if it's about online marketing trends, if it's about data privacy regulations, do you have a strategy for that? Yeah, of course. Um, it's always whenever we, you know, ship anything or there's any kind of change and you know if there's a new visitor coming in we always try to be as um, clear as possible keep the communication clear and um, we all we always have check out our uh, terms and privacy there are a lot of tricks that marketers use you know to get the person to just agree to the terms and conditions or you know stuff like that um, you know but uh, whenever people are coming in like for example affiliates Our uh, affiliate policy is like this small, you know, our affiliates just laugh and they're like, that's it. I'm like, yeah, it's just clear, concise. That's it. And I think communication here is the key. And people would really love it if you're just open to them, be transparent to them, you know, and uh, marketing, there's a, you know, we, we always wear the devil's horns and, you know, guys are just trying to sell us stuff, but it shouldn't be like that, you know. Um, we should be more transparent about the things we do. And that's, I think that's good marketing. You know, we should be able to tell the users, hey, this is what we are doing. This is where your data is going. That creates trust. And that's good marketing, in my opinion. And um, very quickly, I can totally second that. I mean, Uh, we've seen all the numbers about data protection authorities increasingly reacting because end users require transparency. End users are complaining uh, more and more. They understand what's happening, um, et cetera. And it's um, our job, either from the marketing side or also from the uh, compliance side, to reduce the distractions uh, for end users or for potential customers because... <laughs> I mean, to be honest, no one ever opened the internet to read something about privacy, to read something about the Digital Markets Act, Digital Services okay. Act. So uh, looking at that, and we also see, to be honest, a couple of very, very um, good examples there. Uh, Apple, for example, um, in the App Store, before you are downloading an application, um, they're having these privacy icons. Yeah, there's also in uh, Switzerland, there is uh, the privacy associations. 
And um, they are also taking a look at uh, iconization. Can we uh, therefore somehow simplify uh, readability? That's a big point. Uh, also, um, contextual privacy is becoming more and more a trend, which means basically, when do I ask a user for consent? Is it at the beginning, one binary thing, uh, please read it and we never ask you again? Or is it during the whole user experience, which would be whenever you want to take a look at a YouTube video, um, you have to consent. And this is something what end users are more and more easily understand. So um, long story short, uh, I can totally second that. Yeah, maybe Frank, from your experience um, also about the regulations, because I mean, they increase and increase. Do you think sometimes customers should kind of ignore them or should they always try to be uh, chasing like the next regulation and be always unconditionally comply, comply be compliant? Tough question. From my perspective, it all depends how, make, how big you make the time window again to make some kind of judgment. The beginning of our call, I shared a little bit the experience 15, 16 years ago when we started our business and obviously our Backend technology is telecommunication. I was surprised about the hundreds of pieces of paper I needed to read during setting up the company. To be honest, I didn't read them before because otherwise maybe I should never have done it. <laughs> to make a long story short, what I want to say, the telecommunication industry is strongly reg regulated. You know what is the holy grail in there because when you have a phone call, Really, nobody is allowed to listen to this phone call. And I remember one statement of a data protection uh, politician in Germany two years ago. He said, listen, guys, we have our telecommunication uh, regulation. Why don't we simply apply it to the websites? I said, Jesus Christ. <laughs> Well, why? And so on. What do I want to say? Uh, also here, if you go to even more back, one hundred years, it's when telecommunication co came up, the very first phone calls have not been regulated. Then the regulator came and said, oh, we need res to regulate it. Because Abraham Bell, blah, 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 all the evolution of the telecommunication ended up until, or well, the regulation happened until the 80s. You had one company per uh, country who was able to offer phone calls. And then the entire European community uh, uh, union also said we need to deregulate the market in order to uh, facilitate innovation. And as I said, the question is how, make do, how big do we make the time window? Now, if you say, oh, I, from my perspective, as I say, don't be stressed about what is happening. Things are evolutionary, but make sure, of course, you don't have somewhere a pitfall where you burn your brand or where you burn your your money. And these are the two equations we internally ask, or I ask my Marcom team, listen guys, don't meet, don't tell me how close are we today to any kind of regulation which is changing quarterly. <laughs> Try to give me a feeling for how big is the risk for our brand and how big is the risk to pay money to someone who comes, who makes a, a fee uh, for punishing us. This is a, the, the balance between a big curves, five, 10, 50 years, and our daily business, how we try to manage this. The big curves tell me, stay relaxed. Also little companies as ours uh, have been able to manage with uh, regulations. Uh, also uh, uh, DSKVO, um, GDPR, which came up. Everybody was stressed more or less, but today it's can be handled. Uh, so let's stay cool and try to see it for, not from a, a Gary perspective or to, uh, to uh, mention Abra again, just mm -hmm. let's make things objective. How much do we need to pay and what is our brain, um, a brand maybe, uh, how much is it damaged? Yeah, definitely. Maybe Tilman, you as an expert of privacy, maybe like the final words uh, to uh, Frank's answer. Do you agree? <laughs> uh, partly, yes. Yeah. Um, obviously, deregulation uh, could go uh, also in a way of when we are allowed to do everything, then um, we could also limit uh, innovation, I would say, but this is potentially somehow um, a longer discussion. I think actually partly we are prepared here 
uh, in the European Union for further um, regulation, especially from the privacy side, because privacy in the way we are seeing it here is expanding again worldwide. The major markets are already having um, are already having the um, regulations and it's going on and on and on and we are here in the european union we are very much prepared we know how it works now and um, for us it could be easier somehow to expand in the markets right now uh, which are tackling uh, privacy regulations more and more so um but uh, long story short, uh, in that regards, I would say uh, to all of the listeners out there, uh, stay up to date. There are a lot of things uh, that are happening uh, in the meantime. And yeah, also listen to the next episode of the podcast. <laughs> okay. So yep, are nice. We, uh, just wanted to like uh, say something before yeah. this one. Are we going to read the comments? Uh, there's there are a few uh, people like just going to if we got if we have time or if it's for later. I mean, that's okay. Yeah, I would uh, say maybe uh, it's for later. It's a couple of questions. And... <laughs> yeah, All right, yeah. No problem. Yeah. 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 So because it's it's the podcast, so we will reach out uh, to them later. Then uh, because with looking at the time, I think we bring this uh, panel discussion to an end. But also uh, thank you, uh, Frank, Abra, Tillman, uh, for uh, speaking today and also shedding light on some critical topics like AI, data privacy, online marketing trends. Um, and also uh, thank you because this was our first episode of Consented and you made this special. Uh, maybe for our audience, you can find all speakers on LinkedIn. So feel free to connect with them. Also to follow the companies, Mattel, Zodorik and User Centrics. Um, also, if you listen to that podcast, you find all of the information in the show notes. And um, yeah, thank you for being part of it. And I'm very looking forward to our next episode in February. So thank you for listening and bye for now. Thank you for Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>